All right. Hi, everybody. Anybody, if people have questions, just go ahead and uh, put them in the question bar. Okay, perfect. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as, as Keith mentioned, um, I'm going to talk about stress-related illness. And how do I frame that? Um, when we experience stress in our lives, and that can be early life stress, traumas, uh, prenatal, childhood, um, our stress response is activated, and and everything we experience changes our brain and our body. And, and so the way we begin to relate to our lives shifts as a result of stress. Anything that feels overwhelming um, can actually sensitize us uh, to uh, stress later in life. And so I'm going to get deep into that. But what I want you to know is um, this talk is about the um, the mental state that stress puts us in. So I call it the mother of the beast, the mental state that lurks behind all stress-related conditions. And so it, it may be that you think of addiction and depression and anxiety and PTSD and like everything that could put a person in rehab as, as sort of a, a separate thing. I, I want everyone on this call to understand what they all have in common and they all start from the same mental state. And I'm gonna explain that, what that is, okay? And, and if you become a, adept at meditation and mindfulness, you'll be able to see this state in yourself and, and shift away from it once you understand the uh, internal mechanics of shifting your own consciousness, you'll be able to teach it to other people and facilitate their healing. So that's that's what we're on about today. Now, um, as part of what I wanted to show you today is I, I produced a film um, that is gonna be released on PBS uh, this fall. It's called Is Your Story Making You Sick? And um, what we did was we actually filmed uh, eight, courageous participants, they went through um, four four-day retreats that spanned over six months. We actually followed these folks um, weekly over the internet for an entire year, but the, the retreats happened over six months. And the programming that we provided um, was based on this educational model that, that stress illness has a particular cause and how to see the cause. And then uh, the other supposition is is that you know we all we we frame who we are through the story in our mind, and because of stress or trauma, we can develop a distorted story of who we think we are, and that distortion sensitizes the mind body network and in in every other way how we relate to people, places, and things. And so we wanted to help people understand how the story that was already on board and imprinted, how they can begin to influence it and open themselves up to experiences where they amplify instead of the negativities, the amplify positivities in life. Uh, beauty is one thing and beauty is a word that taught that um, I'm going to use to define your intrasubjective experience of uh, improvement in anything. Um, when you see a sunset, only you are aware of the beauty uh, that of you, the experience of your own personal experience of beauty, right? So, so when you taste a, a delicious um, some food, you are aware of that beauty experience. When you see um, or or when you when you um, feel uh, a fabric that feels good. You're aware of that beauty experience. So those are intrasubjective experiences of positivity. I'll call those beauty experiences. And the more that you can incline your nervous system towards amplifying beauty experiences, the better you will feel. Uh, next, we, we are in relationship to other people. And when we connect with other people, what we're doing is we're amplifying goodness. And goodness is that intersubjective back and forth of love and compassion and support and just general positivity. Uh, and then lastly, we are embedded in an objective world. And 
the closer you can hone your nervous system to picking up the truth, like how actually things arise, abide, and pass away, the cause and effect of the reality in which you find yourself, the, the closer your, um, uh, how you um, ferret out, how you perceive and appraise what's happening, the closer you are aligned to the truth, the better you're going to feel. So what I'm trying to teach not only the clients and everybody I work with now, but what we uh, tried to teach the uh, participants in the movie is to incline their nervous system to amplify beauty, goodness, and truth. Okay. So, so that is, is a big message and, and that's behind shifting your story. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to show you a short, it's a 15 minute concentrated clip of the movie. And then I'll get into the uh, science that informed all of the retreats. Okay, so that's what we're going to do right now. And here you go. So I just got the memo that we are to speak to our old self. I really think that through my attempt to teach my children to be more real, what I'm really trying to teach them is to have more internal fortitude and ability to love and cope for themselves instead of seeking out, seeking it out in others always. I'm probably becoming more and more accepting of the fact that um, a good part of my disease is is affected by um, the way I grew up, the way I think, the way I compensated for the way I think. We are like the way that story comes into the world. We are storytelling creatures, like fish live in the sea. We live in stories. The stories in here, the counts that we have of everything in our life. If we have a story that doesn't map well onto what is actually going on in life, stories that we do. I all, we know that the audio has stopped, so we are working on that right now. Of where How about we that? let our attention go. We could mindlessly allow our attention to fixate on that story that hurts us inside, not only mentally and emotionally, but physically too. This is a, a recording device, and it records everything that we've ever experienced. And it reacts to what we've experienced in the way that it reacted in the past. And so that's how we, we live the past. And so new circumstances arise, but we carry this old programming. So how do you change that? Well, you've got to get a perspective on your perspective. And people can and do get better if they learn how to meditate skillfully and they learn how to explore their past programming and deconstruct that past programming and construct new ideas and conceptions of self. The disconnection between me and my mother has a lot to do with why I make bad choices in relationships. When I have a full-blown anxiety attack, I'm in the fetal position on the floor crying hysterically. That's what a full-blown anxiety attack looks for me. And I've been having those since I was 12. 
had some very traumatic experiences when I was a youth growing up in Yuma. I was uh, abducted, molested, raped, and it's made me who I am today. It's a bag full of hypochondrias and obsessive compulsive behaviors. The critical self, you know, that critical, putting myself down, um, not always perfectionism, not being good enough. I felt like we were backpacking in the boundary waters and I was carrying all the bags. I'm here because I've been struggling with depression. I hope to get my spirit back. I hope to get my humor back, my playfulness. Somewhere along the line, there was some sort of event, something that may have happened, and the person came to a conclusion, there's something wrong with me. You know, maybe they were just told that directly by a significant other, by somebody that had power over them, like a parent or a teacher, or maybe they just made a misinterpretation on their own. But once that belief exists and shapes behavior, and the behavior is reinforced because it leads to an outcome, Um, then that thought takes hold and begins to grow as the downward spiral entrenches further and further, coming tighter and tighter and narrowing the person's life. When I think about trauma and the work that I do nationally, we talk about trauma as being pervasive. If we do not look at trauma, we are not going to make a difference in this country in mental health, in addictions, and in primary care. What we've discovered is 98% of the people who cross the threshold of a behavioral health organization, either with addictions or mental health challenges, have experienced significant trauma in their life. You might say that the fundamental pain is the loss of self. And that is a response to traumatic events in childhood. If you look at the studies, the more childhood adversity, like emotional or physical or sexual abuse or a parent dying or a parent being mentally ill or a parent beating another, a parent being jailed, a parent being addicted, any of that, the more of these adverse childhood experiences add up, the greater the risk not only of addiction, but also of psychosis, also of attention problems, also of autoimmune diseases. So the abuse started at four and a half. I remember being extremely scared, you know, of the first time what happened. And I didn't have a childhood. It was taken from me at a very young age. I felt different. I always felt different. Like I didn't really fit. Like only if people knew the real me type of thing. So take, for example, a child who is in a family which is abusive to them either physically abusive, or sexually abusive, perhaps emotionally abusive or verbally abusive. These experiences can overwhelm a child. And we know that there are effects on the brain from the stress hormone cortisol that's released that impair what are called the integrative circuits of This, this is me. And so, <laughs> obviously, this is, is my world, or was the last 30 years. Um, and this played a big part to survive that film. The model. 
uh, and and dream catchers. This is what I'm working on now, and my dreams are literally coming true, which is probably more of the release than any. I was married for just a year. That was 15 years ago. I've been with a lot of women in my life. I lost my virginity when I was 12. So I've been sexually active since 12. But I've never been able to be maintained a long-term relationship. And so my deepest realization here is that but that's, that's the part of me that needs to be healed in order for me to be happy with someone. As we watch these timelines burn, coming back to remembering that we're the authors of our own stories, that our stories are always evolving. And this is just one more opportunity to come back to this moment, to what you're choosing to write and create for yourself. When mindfulness helps us to stop the downward spiral, the world of possibility opens up to us. We step back from the negative event or experience that we were fixated on. And then we become freed to shift our attention to the positive aspects of our experience that we weren't even noticing. We're working ceremony, which is really important. Fears, dreams, imagery. We're trying to work with the pieces that are not one plus one equal two. We're trying to work with the non-rational more intuitive states that actually have a tremendous amount of healing power. When I looked at the people that develop chronic diseases, there were four salient characteristics. I'm talking about people with autoimmune disease, cancer, and so on, uh, ALS, multiple sclerosis. A, they were much more cognizant of the emotional needs of other people than of their own, for their spouses, for example, number one. Number two, there was a rigid identification, the duty, role, and responsibility. Get the job done, never mind how it feels to me. Um, there was a suppression of anger, a great difficulty expressing healthy anger. And finally, they tended to believe that A, they were responsible for other people felt, and B, they must never disappoint anybody. Those beliefs, they were not mistakes. They were not uh, faulty ways of thinking. They were coping mechanisms they developed in childhood. For example, your need is to be connected with your parents, because without that, you don't survive. If your parents are very stressed all the time, one way to make the relationship work is to be more interested or more concerned with how they are doing than with how you're doing. So that becomes one of your characteristics. It's not how you were born, it's not who you really are, but it's how you cope. It was extremely painful to be. What's the feeling right now? Shame. Okay, so you're right where you're supposed to be. To be like shamed and blamed. Um, and to have somebody come in and destroy who you truly are for their own sense of control was just so painful. Mm -hmm. 
and I wore, wore the mask of perfection and everything's okay and I'm fine. Mm. The I'm fine mask is what mm. I wore. Yeah. So as you tap into the shame, what's underneath? That maybe it's true. Maybe I was worthless because all this happened to me. Mm. Maybe I shouldn't sit tell my story because I asked for it. <clears throat> you want to try a different chair? That? There's a couple ways you could go. You could go to what's underneath it. You feel the anger, the injustice. Mm -hmm. You could try that, or you could try hard so Up to you. Feel the anger. Okay. No person should control who you are. That's right. And what else do you feel? You feel the power of the anger? Yeah. Does it feel better than this? Yeah. Okay. Mindfulness is a very simple process of noticing new things. It's bizarre that something so simple can have such profound effects. By simply noticing new things, you realize you didn't know the thing as well as you thought you did, so your attention naturally goes to it. We've done studies now for 40 years where we teach people the simple thing of noticing new things. And by noticing new things, which puts you in the present, makes you sensitive to context and perspective. So you're there, you're engaged. And that engagement is energy producing, not consuming. What we find is that the benefits to virtually all aspects of health and well-being are enormous. Life is like a blooming rose that never stops, it always grows. Before all of the darkness, before all of the shadows, before all of the trauma, there's a beautiful person inside of each of you. Tears are like the gentle rain nourishing the ground again. Oh God. <laughs> Open up my heart again. If I have a story now, it's just going to be to constantly remind myself to be present. You know, that, that, that gift of being present for it all. Alyssa. You are amazing. You need to stop doubting yourself and start realizing who you are. We weave together a new story about our life, a story of our lives as full of meaning, a story of ourselves as strong, resilient, somebody who's a survivor, somebody who thrives. Okay, you guys, I apologize for all the uh, audio issues. Uh, I didn't realize if I muted my mic, I would mute the uh, uh, the sound. It, the, the sound wasn't coming. It was not coming through my computer. It was coming through uh, my um, my microphone. And you got to hear my visceral reaction to things not going well. <laughs> So, oh boy. All right. So anyway, now let's let's get into, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and it set up just sort of the context of um, working with a lot of different co-occurring issues simultaneously and how to do that. So let's let's first talk about where where does stress illness start? Let's let's talk about the mother of the beast, that one mental state that it all comes from, okay? And that is a state that I call attentional fixation. Now, all of us attentionally fixate. When stress goes up, 
our attention is biologically uh, programmed to narrow down onto a particular, the object of our stress, the object of our pain. And when we, we, we have, we have uh, a consciousness that includes awareness, but when attention fixates, all of our consciousness flows through the beam of our attention and we lose awareness. That's what happens. Now, this little guy right here, that is um, the, the metaphor for your consciousness, okay? And, and I don't want you to think about, you, you can see the, guy's, the little guy's face there, but I want you to think about his internal experience. And what I want you to do is experience yourself internally right now, okay? So you're looking at a slide, but I want you to be aware of what's happening on your subtle insides. Now, how our consciousness works is we have attention and attention is like a flashlight of consciousness. It shines from our sense of self, from our subtle interior, and it connects us with an object. There's the subject, object, and there's always this interaction between the two, okay? Can be pleasant, neutral, or negative, all right? But then I also mentioned that we have awareness, and awareness is the whole space of our consciousness. It shines in all, awareness shines in all directions, not just on one thing. Awareness shines into the world. You can see the room in which you're sitting. You can hear what's going on around you. You're, you're aware of the world around you. But you're also, you also can be aware of your body and your mind. So awareness goes into three domains. Attention will shine on an object in one of those three domains at any one time. Okay, it'll always be shining in the world, shining in the body, or shining in the mind, one of those places. You can always find your attention shining in one of those three places. All right, now, mindfulness is balancing your consciousness. It means that you have placed your attention consciously on an object, but you're remaining aware, contextually aware of what's going on in the world, the body, and your mind at the same time. So there's a local attention and a global awareness. That's what mindfulness is, and I invite you to try to do that right now. So pay attention to the slide and my voice and, and the, the lesson, but at the same time, Peripherally now, be aware of the room in which you're sitting, the sensations in your body, and the thoughts in your mind. Everything that's happening in awareness is in the periphery, and your attention is, the flashlight is, is highlighting something that you're paying attention to, okay? Now, attentional fixation is something different. That's when you get triggered by something, and all of, all of your consciousness goes through the beam of your attention, and you can see how the awareness dims. So that's, that's something I want you to take away and realize for yourself. This is a truism, okay? When attention fixates, awareness dims. That is true for everyone. And we've all had an experience of this. We've been driving home and maybe we were triggered by something that happened at work. And so we're not crashing on the drive home. We're going through the green, we're stopping at the red. We get all the way home and then we realize, now how in the world did I make it all the way home? Well, we were driving on autopilot. We were fixated on the story in our head and our body was driving the car, we weren't there. So our awareness had dimmed, okay? that's what happens when a person becomes addicted to something. Person gets, is, is probably unaware of the, the background radiation of discomfort or feelings that they wanna medicate or numb. They get triggered, not necessarily aware of the trigger and the connection to their suffering. Their body, sh this process happens where their awareness, I mean their attention narrows down on the object of addiction addiction they start fixating and and planning uh the use or the acting out right and but they're not aware of that that's what's happening and then they do it right so 
attentional fixation lies at the heart of every single addiction. But think of depression too. Thoughts that captivate your attention, depressing thoughts, keep you from being aware of what you're doing to yourself and a downward spiral starts. The same thing happens with anxiety. You get fixated on whatever is scaring you and the distortion happens, okay? So, so this is the mother of the beast, attentional fixation. Now, the mind-body network, it, there's, there's a mind, I mean, a body attached to everything that your mind is doing. And so if you're fixated in your mind, you're sensitizing your body. And the body, you can, you can think of sensitization and amplification as synonyms because think of a downward spiral. When you become sensitive to something, you need less and less of the stimulus to get a response. So, so everything becomes amplified. Now, how does that happen? There's a triggering event, attention fixates, and then, and I'll show you the connection to emotion in the next slide, but you get an amplified emotion. And what basically is an emotion? It's a contextual understanding of your mind body world the the story that you're um that is coming from you you're appraising this event as being a loss or a threat or an injustice and and the emotion corresponds to the appraisal i'll explain that so you get an amplified emotion an amplified emotion is a distortion your brain is involved in that experience it dumps chemicals and produces physical brain changes basically you're activating this the hyper arousal circuits and then if you've done it enough you'll just keep repeating it this cycle of fixation amplified emotion that changes the brain and the body and you repeat and you will begin to sensitize yourself no matter what and to anything okay all right. Now, in this slide, I want you to understand the relationship. This is this is the slide that explains how stories make us sick. Um, when we have experiences, experiences come with meaning. We've we we when we were born, our nervous systems were open and took in so much more information than they do now. They were fully receptive to information. And what our nervous systems had to do was organize that information and make sense out of it. And part of the making a model of the world and ourself is a process of deletion. So some stuff we stop paying attention to, but other stuff we pay more attention to, stuff that is more salient, related to pleasure and pain. And um, and so there's, there's, we, we develop a sense of ourself in our relationship to the world. And when we become verbal, when we become toddlers, a story starts in our head about who we are and that, that the ongoing life narrative is encoded in us. Now, when we have subsequent experiences later in life, we've already been programmed with this meaning, with this story. So we already know how to relate to the world. So if you're uh in the world as an adult and you lose something that's precious to you i'm going to start with the first appraisal in the uh, left hand column a loss appraisal if you lose something like a loved one or a love relationship you're going to have an emotion and that emotion is going to be sadness that's universal in all human beings so the meaning of an experience loss will produce sadness in all of us. Now, there are two threat appraisals. One is an acute threat and one is a chronic threat. I'll show the emotions here. Now, as we grow up, it's appropriate for us to feel fear at times and fear in and of itself is not a distortion. Um, it's uh, when we're overwhelmed, however, um, that's when we start saying to ourselves, like, I can't handle this anymore. That's threat too. That's, that's where, um, like this, this whole COVID crisis has got 
um, the world in a little bit of a threat to situation. All right, the economy is not doing so well. You may have known someone uh, close to you who has passed or just the struggle, you, you may have lost a job. Um, so there's a lot of threat to going on right now. And your mind-body network is feeling this because it's contextually relevant. It's, it's up for you right now. It's up for all of us right now. Now, when we feel, it, it, it might be that a part of our self-narrative is that we are inadequate. Like, like Jules in the movie, you saw, well, maybe, maybe I, I, there is something wrong with me. Maybe I should feel shame. Well, she got all of that information interjected into her by her family and the traumas, right? And so she carries around this shame base. And, and a lot of us do in certain contexts, all right? Well, shame comes from feeling inadequate. If something happens to you that feels unjust, you're gonna get angry, okay? I just want you to know, the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to connect the emotions that you feel to the context in which you're in. Emotions are contextual. Something's happening in the world, in the body and in your mind. You put all that together and there's this story that emerges in a certain, with a certain theme and based on the theme, you're gonna get a certain emotion, okay? That's, that's important to know. Now, a challenge appraisal can be positive. The first five appraisals arise in, as a result of contacting some sort of negative experience. A challenge appraisal is a positive reaction to a negative experience. It's where I, where you might say, well, this is a spiritual experience. I'm going to handle this in a good way. And you feel determined. Okay. Like all of these emotional responses, other than shame, um, are are, are, are sort of normal responses to contexts. Shame is already comes out of the gate as a distortion. Now, so, so what I'm saying is nothing's wrong with emotions. Stress-related patterns, however, is a greater distortion. That's when you can't let something go and your attention stays stuck. And because it stays stuck, your brain changes, the emotion, uh, amplifies, you repeat, your attention stays fixated, and you make something bigger, okay? Sadness, if you, if you focus on a, an experience of loss long enough, you're going you're gonna to bypass sadness and you're going to become depressed. Fear goes from being a normal reaction to some sort of threatening situation to becoming a distorted reaction, an anxiety-related reaction. And there's lots of different kinds of anxiety-related disorders. They're all distortions. Fear is, fear is a, a, an emotion that you need to have. Anxiety is an emotion that does no one any good. Distress and overwhelm often, and shame often turn into addictions. The distress and overwhelm that we might we might be sensitized because of traumas in our life and what got interjected into us and we're just sensitized people and and just normal life feels overwhelming and we may have found a way of coping by medicating or numbing our emotions and that's where addictions come from or we may be trying to fill ourselves up with people places and things because of our shame and uh, addictions can come from that as well um, anger doesn't stay, anger is a normal emotion, it can activate you, it can get you to right a wrong, but um, if it's distorted, it turns into rage, that's not good for anybody. And determination, even determination can turn into an OCD type. I don't mean Frank OCD, and I should change this slide. Um, it shouldn't say OCD and think of the diagnosis. I, I want you to think of OCD type behaviors where you just can't let anything go anymore, all right? So you see how these, on the right-hand column, these are patterns of distress. These are, these are distorted patterns, stress-related illnesses that arise out of 
uh, distressing contexts, okay? Now, once you're wired up to experience this, you're in a feedback loop. Like, like for example, if you're depressed, that's depressing. Do you see? And so that's why it's so hard to get over and heal these stress-related conditions because they're, they're amplified and, and the feedback brings more. More gets more in these cases. All right, I hope you understand that. Now let me give you another way to think about what I just showed you in that those columns. So the appraisals start here on the left. So the appraisals, you're, you're minding your own business, going through your life, but the appraisals that are coming from you, those are coming from you automatically. You encounter uh, something in your life um, and your judgment, your preconceived, pre-programmed judgment, the appraisal, comes from you, which might trigger you to have some automatic thoughts. Let's just say you were engaged in, in a work group and there's six of you and one of the, the leader of the group said, okay, everybody, can you guys clean your stuff up now? And um, you, for, and, and you weren't aware of this, but you heard that, can you clean your stuff up right now? And all of a sudden you took offense as if it seemed like the person was, um, was scolding you when none of the other people took it that way. So the appraisal of um, injustice came from you, started you automatically thinking about who the heck does that person think they are? And then you start thinking, you know, group leaders are so high and mighty, right? And then you go home and maybe your coping habit is to complain at, to the point where you feel like you need a couple of glasses of wine to calm yourself down. Okay, that's just that's just one way it could pass the process could unfold, right? And 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 perpetuate a habitually distorted story. Now, um Oh, I wanted to talk to you about catastrophizing and hypervigilance. Let me let me just mention two um, psychological features of people who are sensitized. One is they catastrophize, and there's been a lot of research done on uh, catastrophizing, and in a lot of this research I did. As I mentioned, I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I did when I started a pain program at Sierra Tucson. Um, pain patients tend to catastrophize. They see the worst and they expect the worst. And that, that puts their nervous system already on sort of um, shaky ground. And hypervigilance, what hypervigilance is, is it's a, a quality of consciousness where you have a fixated attention. It's not like you're aware of everything because you're not. There is actually very little awareness in a hypervigilant person. The person's attention is hypermagnetized to go towards and sort of suss out potential dangers in the environment. So you're going from one potential danger to and then looking for another potential danger with your attention, a narrowly focused, hyperfixated attention. That's what hypervigilance is. And when people are programmed to be in the world that way, you, you have to um, begin to work with their defenses, make them feel safe. And I'll explain all of this um, in, in setting up the, uh, the way in which you begin helping people dial down the sensitization. Okay, so now I wanna talk about how we are, we're a living system, and you can think of the living system as a story machine, the, a, a, a system that's making its own story, okay? And here's how it does that. Um, we're taking any energy and information in from the world. We process energy and information in our body in the form of sensations. And we also have energy and information cycling through our mind in the form of thoughts, all right? so. And all three of these domains, remember I said awareness is open to three domains, world, body, mind. So these three domains in, of which you could be aware are taking in information, whether you know it or not, okay? Coming in from the world, processing in the mind and the body. And 
how you are programmed to process is how you're programmed to process. And so you, me, everybody else um, finds a way of interacting with the world that really sort of generates some repetitious themes. And people with stress-related illnesses, their attention is magnetized towards negativities. And so the repetitious themes could be loss, threat, or injustice, or inadequacy. You could also magnetize yourself towards positive themes, amplifying goodness, um, truth, and beauty, for example. I mentioned that earlier. Okay, Th That's an alternative where you'd, you'd have to sort of consciously program your nervous system to pay more attention and to amplify the beauty experiences inside of you, the goodness experience between you and others, and the truth experiences that you have. All right, so that's that's what spiritual practice is all about. Now, how does the information get in and, and, and how do we process it and, and make the meaning? Well, I, I, I got this shorthand, these six words, sight, sound, talk, image, touch, feel from my first meditation teacher, Shinzen Young. Um, sights and sounds come in for the world that it, those, re, the word sight and the word sound represent just what you think, what you see and what you hear. Now, in the mind, talk represents thoughts that um, uh, resemble mental sounds. So if you're, if you're talking to yourself inside of your head, or if you have a song stuck in your head, we'll call that talk. We'll agree that that's what a, 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 a sound like thought will agree is talk. A picture-like thought, however, is image, all right? And, and we process the, what we see and hear in the world in our mind through talk and image. And then in the body, we process meaning not verbally, but somatically through touch sensations, which are physical sensations, warmth, coolness, tingling, pressure, pains, joint position, sense. Like if you're sitting right now and you close your eyes, you still know that you're sitting because touch sensations are telling you feel sensations think of those as emotional feelings you you if if i had a lump in my throat because i was sad it wouldn't be telling me about my trachea it would be telling me that i was sad so all of those those six sight sound talk image touch feel that's the basic meaning the 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 the, the how do i want to say this the, think of it as the letters that form the alphabet that writes the words and the sentences and the paragraphs and the chapter of your story. Sight, sound, talk, image, touch, feel. It's always flowing in and it, it's producing the story of you right now. And the story of me in a lot of our clients, the ones that are really suffering, the story of me is the primary fixation. Do you see they're locked in? They're, they're not aware of sights and sounds and the influence of sights and sounds. They're not aware of the influence of talk and image or touch and feel. They're just in their story. Their story has them. They're fixated. Now, the way to begin to heal through mindfulness is you begin to deconstruct the story. Oh, I'm sorry. So repetitious self-talk keeps you locked in. That's what creates the stress-related illnesses. Now, here's what the deconstruction looks like. When you become aware, you can become aware. You can, right now, as you listen to me, be more aware of the sights and the sounds in the world that aren't related to me, just everything else, and how that's contributing to your experience. Now you're more aware of the part that we'll call the world on your broad experience. As you sit there right now, become aware of the sensations, all of them, touch and feel, in your body and how that is a part of your experience. And, and in a sense, in your psyche, isolate that part. You can become aware of just that part of yourself. Now you're being mindful. Now you're deconstructing your experience. You could even be aware of thoughts as they arise, not like thoughts have you, but you can be aware of thoughts arising, you having your thoughts, aware of the mind. Do you see that? 
I, I hope, I, I hope you're able to understand what I'm trying to demonstrate with this slide, that you can learn how to deconstruct your experience. And this is vital for people that are suffering from a stress-related illness, no matter what it is, they have to learn at some point, once they feel safe and resourced emotionally, to begin to work with and deconstruct their constructions. Addiction is a construction. Depression is a construction. Anxiety is a construction. It's something, it's, it's an epiphenomenon, an attractor that their mind body has learned to create. And so if you don't want it there anymore, you have to learn how to deconstruct it. Okay, that's why mindfulness helps with all of these conditions because mindfulness meditation is a deconstructive practice. Okay, good. And please write down all your questions related to this slide if you have them for me at the end. All right, so now let's get into what the my um, clients and what uh, the participants of the movie were doing and, and, and working on. So this isn't per se the mindfulness piece you use mindfulness while you're doing this work it's where you learn to see that your story is a construction and how it gets constructed by itself now shadow work narrative revision shadow work let, let me just define shadow um, for you all okay it's just so we're all on the same page and i know we might we might have different uh, definitions of shadow, but shadow is any unconscious dynamics that have an effect on our personhood. So hidden motives, desires, impulses, patterns that operate out of our awareness, but have significant impact on our lives. Okay. And, and there's, there's three forms of shadow. There's introjection. You got to see um, in that movie, uh, Ju Jules working with an interject. We hadn't gotten to the place where she could see the interject yet, but the fact that she was sort of shame-based, she got a lot of that interjected into her from her childhood. Projections, as you know, um, that's a, well, I, I shouldn't say as you know. So the three types of shadow are interjections, projections, and split ego states. Now, let me, let me just define these. So interjections are, um, is, is material that we absorb from the outside and either it comes in distorted like, like from uh, Jules' parents or we distort it. And, and then once it's inside, then we hold it as true, okay? So interjects arise because when we're babies, like I said before, we are 100% receptive to information. We're, we're, we're in that receptive phase of our life at that beginning in those early stages. And when you work with introjects, you have to use release techniques. You don't, you don't use reowning techniques because the, the introjects have to be released back to where they came from. You don't want to um, integrate uh, an introject. Now, projections are material that we have inside of us already that we project out onto others in the world. Projections arise naturally because as toddlers, our perspective is, is that everyone sees the world the way we see the world. And the way we see the world is true. That's what we as toddlers believe. And there's always a part of us, we transcend that um, ego state, the toddler ego state. We have, we have left that and we have transcended that but it's still included in our psyche. In a sense, we've, we've split off. There's, there's part of us that still, when it wants what it wants, when it wants it, that toddler's driving the bus. Okay, now for projections, you have to use reowning techniques. Now, let me write these things down. Okay, here we go. And um, split ego states are what we're talking about. Now, th those split ego states arise in a bunch of different ways. Um, they can be developmental like when you grow from being 100% focused on yourself to realizing that relationships are important and maybe I can, I, I need to give up on my needs um, so I can relate uh, better with others. 
that's going from a first person to a second person perspective. And that's healthy. There, there can be some unhealthy dynamics there too, but they're, they're, uh, it's, it's, we can develop unhealthy split ego states. For example, if, if we start to see that our needs aren't worthy of being met, and we see that our first person perspective as selfish and or wrong, okay, that's a split ego state that has a little bit of dysfunction in it. Okay, and so now the shadow work that people do involves five steps. Shadow, of course, the first step is, is that the person is unaware of what's going on uh, and even of their symptoms. Uh, then at a certain point, like, like when, when you're in the unaware stage, let's say, let's say you're working with an alcoholic who's in the unaware stage, they, that person isn't aware that alcohol is a problem for them. They're unaware they're, And because they're, they're not really, uh, aware of the symptoms. Now, the second phase is they become aware of the symptoms, the hangovers, the loss of the job and, and relationships are hurting. Right. And so when when you become symptom aware it's it's not like you get the full picture you 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 think when you're symptom aware if you can just get rid of the symptoms the problem goes away and so for the hangover you might take some ibuprofen problem solved right uh well the problem's not solved uh then at some point a person waking up to his or her her shadow becomes aware of the triggers. The triggers in their life then become the problem. Like the person, this alcoholic that I'm talking about sees his boss as a trigger and the work uh, that he's doing that he doesn't like as a trigger, his nagging wife at home. And like then, just like the symptoms were the problem in at the lower stage of awareness, now the triggers are the problem. And, and still the, the, the problem is outside of you. And what you're trying to do is gain some semblance of management over your triggers. All right, Th this is actually the first step when you become trigger aware of when you start self-managing a little bit. It's, it's not 100% healthy, like you're trying to distance yourself from the triggers. And sometimes isolating yourself creates its own problems, but you're attempting self-management at the trigger aware, aware stage. Then at some point, this is the, the, the fifth level, you become process aware. Now, let me see, do I have another slide that shares this? Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me, so you guys can make, um, so you guys can uh, write notes. The, the, the fourth step is process aware. Now, process aware is when you're aware of the uh, symptoms and you're aware of the triggers and you're aware of the link between the triggers and your symptoms inside of yourself. Like you're, you're starting to notice how your insides are reacting to the experience that you're having. This is a major step forward in waking up because now all of a sudden you're a little bit more open to feedback. You're working with a therapist. And the therapist primarily is, is helping increase the process awareness. This is where mindfulness really comes in. And, and that skillfully aware uh, slide that you saw two slides ago, working with um, energy and information in the world, the mind and the body, you're starting to become aware of perhaps very subtle uh, images in your mind or talk or or feeling states in your body well before you're aware of the symptoms well before you start acting out okay very important part of waking up and then also what uh happens a lot in therapy is you have a therapist that helps you come to a resolution through conscious conceptualization and what conscious conceptualization is is that you you're aware of sort of the core lie that was interjected into you uh, perhaps or or the projection that's keeping you stuck and you're able to deconstruct that and reconceptualize 
uh, make sense of the self-narrative and reconceptualize it in a way that frames you as surviving and and going forward in in a way that you can project that you could thrive right you you you're you're reconceptualizing your story and projecting it into the future where you have um some expectation of a positive outcome all right that's that's very basic uh shadow re resolution technique all right so now i want to give you guys an experience of the mindfulness piece that I do with people. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna affect the flow of the energy and information, right? That's cycling through each of you. And I'm talking about your interior space, that subtle inside that's listening to me. Okay, listen to yourself, listen to me right now. That space that's listening, we're gonna affect the flow of energy and information by working with your mind. Okay, so. Um, mind is like a space, and if you can see me, I'm not sure if you can see me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a, a, a cube, an outline, a cube with my hands. And if you can't see me, just imagine uh, an invisible cube in front of you, and then remove the sides of the cube, and you're looking at a space, right? Well, mind is like that in a couple of different ways. The qualities of mind are that mind itself, and when I say mind, I'll I'm, think awareness. Awareness doesn't have an edge. Awareness doesn't, isn't, if you really look as a deep meditator, you will not ever be able to find the boundary of your consciousness. It doesn't stop at your head, it doesn't stop at your skin. And this is, again, one of the truths of a higher perspective. And a person can open themselves up to, now when we, at lower, more concrete perspective, you think you do end at your skin. But as a person develops their consciousness, they become very clear, absolutely clear that consciousness does not stop at the boundary of your skull or your skin. And that there, if you really tune in, you can't find any edges to your consciousness and mind itself like a space is also empty ultimate mind doesn't have anything in it okay now energy and information flow through it but mind itself is the space in which those objects of energy and information flow so there's a space of mind and there's the objects that flow through all right now here's our little guy that's our that's our conscious symbol for consciousness again there's the flashlight of attention which is directed outward here is the awareness okay awareness is the awareness in all directions and mindfulness again just to re uh just to repeat mindfulness is placing your attention so consciously place your attention and stay aware of the whole space now what's the whole space world body mind here's what i'm going to do i'm going to ask you to meditate now on this orange dot i just want there's nothing special about this orange dot and i'm not going to hypnotize you because you're going to stay aware all right so look at the orange dot and don't move your eyes now start to discern with your attention the qualities of the orange dot notice that it's brighter on top and darker on the bottom. And if you really stare at it, notice that it's a little bit pixelated. You may even see sort of uh, an, an aura around the outside. If you keep your eye of the dot, if you keep your eyes perfectly still, your nervous system has a hard time clarifying the edge. And so you're gonna see a little smearing of probably what looks like a, a, a greenish aura around the outside, almost looks like um uh, a solar eclipse kind of a thing okay so you're looking at the dot now don't move your eyes but become aware of the whole rest of the space of the room in which you're sitting peripherally now don't move your eyes see right left up down even notice the space between your nose and the computer screen notice the space Use your ears in the same way. 
listen right, left, up and down behind you. And remember I said, listen to the middle of your head as you listen to me. Direct your hearing sense inwardly. Listen inside. Good. Now you're 100% aware of the world. The space of the world. I'll use that word quite a bit. The space of the world. Good. Now, you may not be, but I want you to become aware of your body right now. And some of you had no awareness of your body. All of a sudden, it blinked on. From the tips of your toes to the top of your head, feel everything, all the touch and the feel sensations. And I really want you to feel what you can feel, but also try to feel what you can't feel. There are parts in your body that are empty of sensation. Like you can't feel your femur bones. Notice that. It's just empty space that feels like the body. And, and now I want to show you, if you're really in tune, don't move your body. And you may even decide to close your eyes. Uh, try to feel the edges of your skin. And notice that you can feel a whole bunch of sensations but there's nothing that communicates an edge. And if you're having a hard time feeling edgelessness, just pick warmth. Pick your warmth. Feel, isolate warmth with your attention. Attend to warmth. And notice that warmth doesn't have a beginning or an end. It doesn't have a place where you can feel it like like start or stop, like it's trailing, your warmth is trailing away from you like a fog. It's warmth is a radiation into the space. And remember, I said the the higher perspective that you have, the less solid you're gonna feel. So I'm trying to turn your body into a space right now. And now let's go into our mind. And if you if you don't know what how to go into the mind, Imagine where your brain is. It's right behind your eyes. Now, I know you cannot perceive your own brain, but you can place your attention in the space where you think your brain is. Be attentive to that place behind your eyes and in between your ears. And notice what you notice there. Notice it just feels like an awake space looking through eyes and listening. Now don't move, just notice that awareness, the qualities of it. The quality is like space. It's empty. It's spacious. Nowhere where it starts or it stops. But it's also luminous. It has the capacity to know. For example, you're hearing the sound of my voice right now in the space of your mind. But the sound of my voice is not a part of your mind per se. It's just a coming and a going. Just like the orange of that dot, your mind is not orange. Your mind is not warm. Notice that the mind doesn't have any qualities at all. It's empty. Okay, now you're really aware. Now you are deconstructing your experience. Do it right now. Notice the part that's the world. Notice the part that's the body. And notice the part that's the mind. And you could put it all together into one whole space of awareness. And when you meditate, this is what you do, but you direct your attention to one thing. You want to train your attention. You want to train yourself to have more influence over your attention. And so part of the game with meditating is place your attention on the breath and try to limit the time that your mind wanders. You stay aware, globally aware, but locally attentive to breath. And you set this mental balance up. And then if the balance degrades and your attention fixates and your mind starts to wander, you just set it up again. That's skillful meditation. Okay. Woo! Let's talk about, so come back to, to me right now and to yourself. Um, thanks for meditating. Okay, we're getting to the end of 
our discussion here, I just want to review the objective. So we discussed the critical roles of attention and awareness. Attention is the flashlight of consciousness. Awareness is the whole space. Awareness has the, the big picture role. You have to stay aware to know where your attention is. All right. And, and when a person has a stress-related illness, they have a bias towards being attentionally fixated and you have to work to open their awareness and teach them to notice when they're fixated. All right, that's the beginning of the change. All right, and uh, I wanna list three mindfulness-based attunement practices. Now, I hadn't mentioned these yet, but I wanna mention these. The first is that deconstructive practice where you break things into world, body, mind, all right? So, so that's a practice that you can teach your clients, all right? The next one is a very simple practice, um, and this also comes from my meditation training. It's called strong determination. And, <coughs> excuse me, strong determination is basically teaching someone when they meditate to sit perfectly still. Now, why would you want to do that? You'd want to do that because there are very subtle impulses to move and react and to disconnect from our feelings. And, and we do that when we move our body. And when we meditate, the more you move, the less you're able to concentrate. It disrupts your concentration. And so if part of the concentration is being used to help you deconstruct your experience so you can use meditation therapeutically, then you have to learn how to sit still. Now, this practice, strong determination, isn't something that I give you know, a person on the first day who's had trauma and doesn't feel safe because sitting perfectly still can feel very unsafe and overwhelming. So you have to titrate this, but it's a very powerful practice, okay? You can teach a person to meditate, but if, if you don't give them the added instruction, let's say they've been meditating and you're making progress, your progress will plateau and not accelerate if they keep scratching every itch on their face, for example. You know, you have to get them to the place where they're metabolizing, they're processing and purifying all of the discomforts that are coming up from them to disrupt the meditation. And they're working with those distractions and this, those disruptions in real time. So you, this process embeds resilience. It embeds distress tolerance, all right? That's strong determination. Um, and hey, the Mark, last, yeah. I just want to let you know we have about five or six questions. And, and we're okay, 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 all right. So um, then I'm going to move on really quick here. I didn't get to explain my last practice. Um, and maybe I can do that through the questions. Okay, identifying the role of narrative revision and shadow work. Okay, I think I did a reasonable job with that. All right, you guys, 